started. Um, welcome to the first regular session for today. I hope you enjoyed the keynote. Um, I'm Jonas, I'm giving the talk today. Um, I'm working for Eclipse Source. We are a company providing services, training, consulting around Eclipse technologies. Um, and in this role as a consultant and um, as a developer who typically helps, and now that I start, all the people come in. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Um, in, in my role as a software engineer, which, uh, who typically helps other people um, getting um, Eclipse technology uh, done the right way or use Eclipse technology in their projects, um, I observe a recurring theme when people get started with Eclipse. So Eclipse is really a powerful and very mature platform. And if you use the technology in the right way, it can save you a lot of time and a lot of costs, a lot of effort. That's true for the initial implementation, but also for the ongoing maintenance. However, um, Eclipse is also a complex thing. And it adds some new concept to the standard Java world. Um, and if you're not familiar with those concepts, they can be very confusing in the beginning. In turn, in the beginning of a project, you typically have to do some basic decision which influence your project later on. But typically in the beginning of a project, you don't have much experience with the new, new technologies. So that's why I came up with this talk. Um, it's a collection of questions um, which typically come up uh, when people get started with Eclipse. So that's all the questions I typically observe in, in projects. Um, and I just created a collection of them. <clears throat> One warning, 30 minutes is definitely not enough to answer all frequently occurring questions because there are just too many of them. Um, I picked the most important ones from my point of view. Um, and also 30 minutes is not even enough to answer the most important one in, on a detailed level. But what I did um, in parallel when I prepared this presentation, I created a textual version um, of this talk with more details about the, the questions that I will present today. Um, I plan to block this in, in my blog, um, but you can get, an ex exclusively for you, you can already get a PDF, um, and that's downloadable under this link in the top right corner. I will have this link on the last slide too. So whenever you miss some details, please have a look at this PDF, and I'm also happy for feedback if you miss general question in this FAQ. Um, I might have the time to add them. Um, yeah, so let's get started with the presentation. And <clears throat> one other warning, this is really um, meant to be a beginner talk. So I will not go um, into advanced features. My goal is to provide you a basic overview of all the Eclipse concepts that you typically have to deal with in your, in your project. So let's start with the first question. Um, ah, one last thing. I tried to order the questions a bit. Some of them are depending on each other. Some are completely out of order. So it's basically a collection of different questions. So for, first question is, what are, or what do the, the terms OSGI, bundle, and feature mean? Um, and there's another term typically used, uh, which is a plugin. So what's the relation of those terms? <coughs> so let's get started with OSGI and bundle. Um, if you develop a plain Java application, outside of Eclipse, um, you typically have a monolithic thing. You have a main method. You can have some modularity with jars. So you can add new um, frameworks by putting jars on the class path. However, you don't have true modularity because whatever you put on the class path, you can access. And there is no um, concept of creating modules, um, which can be, for example, um, define an API and which can um, define dependencies between each other. That's my, that might change a bit with Java 9, but that's the current situation. Um, and this concept of modularity, that's exactly what OSGI adds to the Java world. OSGI is a standard which is implemented by Eclipse. Um, the Eclipse component implementing the standard is called Equinox. That's a runtime component. And it basically enables you to build up an application consisting of modules. And the OSGI term for a module is bundle. So your application is not one monolithic thing, <coughs> but it contains an arbitrary number of 
bundles. And the good thing is in OSGI, you can change the configuration of your application so you can deploy bundles. And that can even be done um, if an application is already deployed. You know this feature, if you start your IDE, you can install new things into it. And that's exactly using this feature of deploying bundles into an existing application. <coughs> when talking about the IDE, there's another term called plugin, and there's confusion between bundle and plugin. The confusion comes from the history of Eclipse. When Eclipse was originally developed, um, it had a custom module system from the beginning, for, so from 2000. Um, and that was basically based on plugins, and it was not related to OSGI. In 2005, um, Eclipse deprecated its own module system and switched to OSGI. And from that time, all plugins in Eclipse are essentially bundles, so it's actually the same. However, the term plugin is still used in the IDE area because it feels natural that if you have an existing IDE and you put something in, some new features, that you call this a plugin. But essentially or technically, a plugin is exactly the same as a bundle. The last term um, in this question is a feature. If you look at a typical OSGI application like the Eclipse IDE, you easily have hundreds if not even thousands of bundles in it. So there's a lot of stuff in it and it would be very complex to configure or deal with such an application on that level because you, for example, you would have to configure all the bundles which are in the application and which are not. Um, and features are a way to organize bundles. Essentially, features are just groups of bundles. So you can define that a feature consists of, I don't know, three, seven, or whatever bundles. Um, and features can also contain other features. So you can group all your software together and then create units that you can actually manage. If you, for example, install something in the IDE, you typically don't install single bundles, but you install features, which then contain a group of bundles realizing the feature that you want to install. Okay, um, I've mentioned the IDE uh, before, um, but there are two other areas where Eclipse can be used, um, and that is the term RCP, stands for Rich Client Platform, and also as a tool platform. So <clears throat> I want to explain the different use cases you can use Eclipse for, because that's a very confusing thing if you work with Eclipse. So let's start from the bottom and I will build up the dependency hierarchy of the different use cases for Eclipse. Um, so at the bottom we have the JVM and if we just use the JVM we build a standard Java application that has nothing to do with Eclipse. We can decide to build up an OSGI application. This still doesn't have much to do with Eclipse. You can use some Eclipse technologies for that but it's not that you create a desktop application, it's pure OSGI. This is typically done either in the embedded area or on s for server applications, not so much for the desktop. So it's o you only depend on OSGI, and OSGI itself depends on the JVM. Then there is a platform, or uh, basically the things on the left side, starting from here, they are features. So they are big features containing a lot of bundles, and you can depend on those features. Um, the rich client platform is a collection of frameworks enabling building general purpose application. So this has nothing to do <coughs> with development tools, but this can be any kind of application you want to develop typically for the desktop. So things like, I don't know, an MP3 player, an a, uh, um, ERP system, or whatever application you want to develop. And if you want to do that, you depend on these rich client platform, which provides you features like perspective management, views, preference management, all the stuff that you are, that you are used to when you use Eclipse, you can reuse to create uh, general purpose applications. So based on this rich client platform, there's another um, sub-feature of Eclipse, and that's called the tool platform. It, it is based on RCP, and this platform contains um, features which are typically needed and required when you implement development tools. For example, the debug framework, or um, resource management, or a text search, uh, such things. <clears throat> this tool platform is 
still language agnostic, so it doesn't have, it doesn't su provide support uh, for a specific programming language. Um, but you can use this platform to create IDEs or tools to support programming. As for example, and there are many existing tools doing that. For example, the um, C development tools, um, CDT, they are based on the tool platform or other like the Python tooling. And there are many in-house applications from different companies who develop their own development tooling based on this tool platform. The most well-known tool which, do, uh, which does that um, are the Java development tools, JDT. And that's the classic Eclipse Java IDE that you probably all know. Um, it's based on the tool platform. It adds Java support, but it uses a lot of features from the tool platform. <coughs> And you can even use that as a dependency, and that's the case if you, if you only want to extend the Java um, IDE. In this case, you typically speak about a plugin that you develop. This plugin has a dependency to the Java tooling, for example, check style support or JIT support or whatever you want to support in the IDE. Um, and that has then the dependency on JDT. So those are the different use cases. And that's a confusing thing actually because there are so many different use cases for Eclipse. The other confusing thing is that you typically use Eclipse as an IDE too. So you, for example, if you develop an RCP application, you typically use this um, as an IDE. And that leads to the next question. Um, what is a target platform? Short question, who of you has defined a target platform before? Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, if you develop something with Eclipse, um, you start your IDE, that's the tool that you use, and this IDE um, accesses the workspace, and in this workspace you have the bundles that you develop. So that's this this thing here. So that's your source code basically. That's the bundle that you create. Now, if you start or deploy your application, you get a running application. Um, but typically, your source code uses some other bundles, and those bundles are typically already existing. So typically, you're reusing some Eclipse frameworks, like the Eclipse runtime or like um, some bundles from JDT. So you're not developing that on your own, but you're just reusing them. So your bundle has a dependency to those other bundles. Now, if you deploy your application, those bundles have to be deployed too. They need to get part of the application that you develop. Now, the question is, <coughs> in your workspace, you only have your own bundles. The question is, where does this come from? There has to be a place or a directory or whatever where those bundles are located, the, the bundles you have a dependency on. And that's exactly what a target platform is for. So a target platform defines basically locations um, in which the bundles are you loca uh, located, you have dependencies on. So <clears throat> if, for example, this is compiled and it has dependencies to third-party libraries or bundles, and those are need to be in this target platform. There are different um, types of target platforms or basically different types of locations you can define in a target platform. The simple thing to, to use is a directory. That's just a plain directory um, and in this directory um, all the bundles that you need in your target have to be, uh, have to exist. That's the simplest form. Um, directory is simple, but if you have um, several developers working on a project, you typically want to share the target platform, and uh, if you don't have a file server, directory is probably not the best technique for a target platform. So there is a second possibility. Um, that's, I would say, the most commonly, commonly used one. Target platforms can also point to update sites, um, and typically you use the update sites provided by Eclipse, so you point to those update sites. Update sites are locations in the internet uh, you can access over a web server. And then the bundles get downloaded from there. There's a local cache. And then your application or your bundles get compiled against those um, downloaded bundles. <clears throat> and there is a third one, which is, again, a little bit confusing. Um, you can also 
point from a target platform to an existing Eclipse installation. The reason for that is this IDE up here, if we remember the slide before, it's also an OSGI application and it contains a lot of bundles. And actually as the IDE is probably the, the biggest application based on Eclipse, it contains most of the common frameworks that you will use for your own development. Um, and <clears throat> on disk, such an IDE is actually just a directory of bundles there's some additional stuff, but the bundles are there. So you can point to an existing Eclipse installation, which is almost the same as directory. So, but instead of pointing to a plain directory, you point to the program directory of your Eclipse installation. Um, and <coughs> there is one, um, one tricky thing which um, makes the definition of a target platform a little bit confusing, especially for beginners. I've just asked the question, who of you has defined a target platform before? And most people said no. You might wonder, but some of you might already have developed some bundles and you might wonder how does that work? If you don't define a target platform, how can you develop bundles? Because they immediately they have some dependencies and that wouldn't work. Their Eclipse, every Eclipse IDE ships with a default target platform. This default target platform is of type Eclipse installation and it actually points to the running IDE itself. That means the IDE will use itself to compile bundles which are in the workspace. This is good and bad. The good thing is you don't have to configure something in the beginning because you already downloaded the Eclipse IDE. The bad thing is that it doesn't force you from the beginning to deal with the target platform and this default is actually, it's, it might be nice for the first couple of hours, but if you really start a project, you should explicitly define your target. And um, the reason for that is um, you want to have separate control of the things that you have in your IDE and the things you deploy in your application. For example, the IDE is something you typically frequently update. So if there is a new Eclipse version, you typically want to get the latest version because it's usually better. While for the running application, you might, might not deploy every update of Eclipse. So let's assume you just released your application and it's tested and it works great. So you don't want to do every version jump from Mars to Mars 1 to Mars 2 and so on. The other thing is if you use this default, you have to ensure that all the developers which work on the project have exactly the same IDE as the running platform. That in practice that doesn't work. And it actually creates a lot of problems. So recommendation get rid of this and use either this or this instead. There are some more detailed descriptions in the PDF in the download. Um, when talking about target platform and version, there's one common question around since I would say three years or four years and that's should, should I use Eclipse 3.x, 4.x and what is this E4 thing? So first answer is E4 is not a version of Eclipse. E4 was a project which originally created the 4.x stream. So that's not really a version. In fact, we have to decide between 3.x and 4.x. Now, <clears throat> to really uh, understand the options that we have, we have to look a little bit more in detail on what changed between 3.x version and the 4.x stream. Um, if we look at the typical 3.x application, so that would be your custom application, what we see here are the most commonly used frameworks in an Eclipse application. Of, typically you have more dependencies, but that's the most commonly used stuff. So we have the Eclipse runtime, we have OSGI, we have F SWT and JFace. And we have what we call the workbench. <coughs> the plugin implementing this is Org Eclipse UI. This provides features like perspectives, editors, views, commands, handlers, all this stuff. Um, the Eclipse 4 stream only changes this plugin. So if we have a pure Eclipse 4 application, we still use the Eclipse runtime, OSGI, SWT and JFace, but all the stuff which is related to the workbench, and that's the registration of views, editors, handlers and all the stuff, has a completely different API. 
It's based on concepts like application model services and dependency injections. I will not go into detail about that, but that's not compatible with the old API anymore. However, the good news is if you have an existing 3.x application, you don't have to re-implement everything because there is another bundle and that's called compatibility layer. This compatibility layer <coughs> provides the same API as, as 3.x has done, but it translates all the API calls to the new API, but you don't have to take care about this. So, if you have an existing 3.x application, that's also an option so you can switch to um, 4.x without using the new API, but you don't have to change your code. Now, <clears throat> let's wrap this up a bit. Um, what are the options that you have? Um, you should definitely go not go for 3.x anymore, meaning you should not download any, if, you, if you're starting a project now, you should not download a 3.x version. At start with 4.x and choose between pure Eclipse 4, that means you use the new API, or compatibility layer, meaning you use the old API, but still the version is 4.x. Um, there are some possibility to mix both. I have described this more in detail in the PDF, but um, in general you have to decide whether you go for pure um, um, if Eclipse 4 or compatibility layer. The existing IDE related frameworks, so things like JDT, XML editors, language support, and all the stuff, they are typically still using 3.x and there's not much movement that they migrate to Eclipse 4. That means to make, come up with a good decision for your own project, um, you should look at the frameworks that you plan to use. That's the most important uh, thing. If you have many 3.x based, and that's, that's now the API, that doesn't mean you use 3.x versions, but the compatibility layer API. If you have many of those, like many uh, IDE related stuff, you probably should go for the compatibility layer. That's also true if you develop a plugin for the IDE, because all the existing IDE stuff is based on 3.x. If you have only a few 3.x based components, you should evaluate whether it's easily possible to, trans to migrate them to Eclipse 4. And finally, if you have no, nothing 3.x based, then you should consider to write a pure Eclipse 4 application because it has the cleaner API. In any case, I strongly recommend, even if you develop for the 3.x API, to do it in an Eclipse 4 friendly way. Um, that would be another 30 minutes talk. <laughs> Um, but I spend some time to describe this more in detail in the PDF again. I think it's at least five pages of description. Okay, so now we switch. Uh, there's a little bit of a topic break. Um, next question is how to define APIs. And that's a really important thing. Um, we've learned before that OSGI basically enables to split your application into bundles and that you can move them into your application um, and slice and dice them to, to build up your, um, uh, your system. However, um, if you don't deal with APIs, um, using OSGI doesn't provide any benefit because then you could just use jars. Uh, if we look at this example here, we have two bundles. Um, bundle one has a calling class and bundle two has some classes which have dependencies. And this calling class is now calling all those classes. So it has dependencies to everything in the second bundle. If we now want to, for example, replace bundle two, which is one of the typical use cases you want modularity for, um, you basically have to re-implement all those classes because you have really have a lot, uh, you have a large interface that you offer to this class and modularity doesn't really provide any benefits here. Um, what OSGI allows you to do is um, to explicitly define packages which can be accessed by other bundles and packages which cannot be accessed. And the default should be that packages are not accessible. And that's what we see here. So we have moved all the code down here in an, what we call an internal package. And we only have, it's, 
as slim as possible API. So this is a package which is um, visible to other bundles and bundle one is only accessing this package. And typically you only or you mainly have Java interfaces in API package, no classes, because interfaces, they don't reveal the, the um, implementation underneath. And in this, <coughs> if you use this architecture, it's much easier to maintain your application because if you replace this bundle two now, let's say this is providing some backend implementation or backend access and let's assume you switch to a new backend so you have to re-implement the communication. You only have to touch the internals but you don't have to touch this class because it communicates over an API. In this simple example this doesn't look much but if you build up a complex application you don't have only one caller but you have tens or even hundreds. So and to be able to manage this complexity and replace and maintain only separate things, you need to define APIs. Again, technically, I have some more descriptions in the PDF how to really do that in, in, in OSGI. Um, question on how to set up a build. This will be no build tutorial, of course. Um, the answer is pretty simple. You should use a technology called Maven Tiger for that. There are other build technologies out there um, but Maven Tiger has been chosen as the common build infrastructure in Eclipse and it is de facto the best technology to do that. If you're familiar with Maven, you, um, it's pretty similar to setting up a Maven build. Um, um, the only difference is you use Tyco. Additionally, that's a plugin for Maven. It enables two things. The first, it, is, um, it supports to build Eclipse specific artifacts like bundles, features, and products. I will come to that. Um, and second, it can read the information from OSGI artifacts. So in general, if you specify um, a build with Tyco, your POMs are typically smaller. They don't have to contain so much information. So for example, dependencies are not contained in POMs. They are already specified in the bundles. So what we see here, we have a POM for every bundle, we have a POM for every feature, and we have a POM for one more artifact I didn't mention before. That's a product. Because you might wonder, if we just deal with bundles and features, um, at some point in time we have to define, okay, what's now in our final application? And that's done with a product. A product is basically a collection of bundles and features and it adds some more branding information like an icon and which class should actually be executed on startup. And also a, cl uh, a product can be built with Maven Tyco to finally create um, a launchable application. Okay, um, the last question for today. Um, and that's the question on how to select technologies. So as you might see here on the conference, Eclipse is not only um, one thing, Eclipse is a very huge ecosystem of many different projects and technologies and there, there is not only one technology per use case. So for many things that you want to do, there are even two or even more technologies which, which can help you in your product. So what I want to do here is provide some guidelines on what you should think of if you, if you choose to use a certain technology. <clears throat> please take some time for te technology decisions. Um, if you start to use a framework, it can save you a lot of costs if it's the right framework, but it's, it also influences your project over time. And you might even invest in that framework. So if you didn't do the choice right, it might also cost you some money. So um, please don't do this like, ah, oh, I need a framework, then just download it. Um, create some process, discuss that with your colleagues, get some help on the decision, because you might, want, you might need to stay with that framework over years. Um, so if you haven't spent this time initially, it might strike you later. In turn, do, do not reinvent the wheel. Um, <clears throat> many existing frameworks look a little bit complex in the beginning, um, and a thing which frequently happens is that people um, don't want to get into the existing frameworks, but um, um, alternatively they start their own implementations. 
Good example is there is a framework called EMF, and I've seen at least five different um, frameworks at customer places which do exactly the same thing as EMF, but not as good as EMF. Because people started, they wanted, they, they looked at EMF, but then they found some reason, I don't know, it's too complex or whatever, and then they started to build up their own solution. And what typically happens is, over time, your own solutions will typically become as complex as the original framework. Reason for that is, if you start to implement something, you typically don't see all use cases and all complexity. Look at articles, blogs, and websites. So spend some time on searching, and even better, and that's, that's what you all have done, visit events, because that's a good opportunity to um, also see the people behind technologies um, attend talks and so on. Um, besides the Eclipse cons, there are also a lot of demo camps where you can see um, talks about or demonstrations about different technologies. If you find a project interesting and you think that might help you in your um, development, have a more detailed look. Look at the committer activity, what are the people behind there, how many commits do they do, are they still active? That's important for you because if there's no active community, um, you will not get any updates and you will not get any help. Um, other indicators are news group activity. Are in news groups, you can ask questions and you also see are there other users? Because if they ask questions, then you know, okay, there are at least 10 other people using this framework too. And of course, it's important that um, questions are answered by, by somebody. Try to understand the stakeholders of a project. That means why is somebody spending time on this project? That can be, maybe it, it is some individual developer who does that in his free time. That's nice, but is that really enough to keep a project stable over time? Is it a big company um, who have a lot of money and they use it heavily themselves? Typically good sign, but if we look at a lot of, for example, if we look at some Google frameworks, uh, you, you thought, for example, for GWT, okay, it's Google, they will maintain it, but after a few years, they basically deprecated it again. Um, or are there some companies who make money with support services? That actually is typically a good sign because at, as long as a company is contributing to a project and they make money with that, they will continue to do. So it's not bad if, if a company is uh, driven by um, so-called service providers. <coughs> of course, it depends on the prices they offer. Definitely get in contact with the people behind the project. Describe your use case. Most of the project owners, they ha are happy to discuss use cases with you and they will also tell you, does, is this a good use case or doesn't it make sense to apply the framework? And also ask them questions like, what are your plans with the framework? Will you support that? Can you give us training? And so on. You should not expect anything that anything happens without your influence. That means don't expect that a framework will be maintained by itself. You should be ready to invest in frameworks, especially if you are heavy users. So um, open source is great in sharing costs between different companies. So you don't, if you compare using a framework to implementing all the stuff you own, if you implement it on your own, you have to maintain it yourself forever. If you use an open source framework, you can share the costs with other users, but you should, should still be prepared to take over some of those costs. Good. Um, that was the last question. Um, there were some questions um, which didn't made it into the presentation, but I still have them in the PDF. For example, how to manage dependencies, how to deal with versions, um, how to create good modularity and so on. The textual version can be found under this link. Um, don't be frightened, it's 25 pages long, I think. <laughs> um, and as I said, I, I will probably also block this soon. If you have any additional question, you can come talk to me after the talk. You can send me an email and I'm typically also at our booth. Um, so you can join me there, ask me any kind of question. If you're missing some questions in the PDF or in this talk, I'm also interested in that. So if you have the feeling I typically don't understand this or that, just tell me, I might be able to add that to the, to the FAQ. And finally, I kindly ask you to evaluate that um, session. So you have to go to eclipsecon.org, log in, click on the session, and then on the right side, you can give 
um, a plus one, and I don't think that there are any other options. <laughs> um, if you have something specific to tell me, um, there's a comment field. I'm happy for any comments um, because that helps to, to do better uh, presentations. And besides that, I thank you for your time. And are there any questions? Okay, then thank you again and enjoy your day.